Well, we're doing a bit of a technical episode today, talking about some GPS units. Welcome to one of the smaller lakes which are dotted around the centre of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And I wish I had better news to share with you today. We're going to be talking about GPS units, and in particular, a couple of Garmin GPS units. Now, of course, GPSs are one of the key safety devices that we have in our armory today. We're no longer having to navigate like they did 100, 200 years ago. And so we do have the benefit of being able to, if all is well, finding out exactly where we are accurate to a few feet. It's great news. But I've been having a problem with a particular type of Garmin GPS unit, one of the small ones. This is the latest in the 30 series of small E-Trexes. So this is the Garmin E-Trex 32X, which is the one with all the bells and whistles before you start upgrading to the ones with much larger screens, bigger joysticks and so on. It's supposed to be fantastic. And as we all know, Garmin have kind of dominated the small handheld GPS market for a long time now by either outcompeting or just buying up all the other manufacturers. And so pretty much if you want one of these small units now, your choice is Garmin or Garmin. A quick tangent on that before our difficult conversation gets going. We used to have a few manufacturers out there making handheld GPSs, and I'm not counting things like boat chart plotters or road vehicle satellite navigation. I mean the little devices you hike, bike, ski, kayak, whatever with, in your pocket or rucksack. Magellan used to, and indeed were the trailblazers in the 1990s, but their range petered out more than five years ago. A few others like Satmap, Mio and Navigon either got eaten up by Garmin, went bust or stopped making these sorts of units. Today, for a lot of people, of course their phones will do the job. Almost all contain at least one type of GPS receiver, and there are tons of mapping apps you can download free or buy. Importantly, most allow you to download mapping so you can use your phone as a GPS nav unit in the wilderness. But, and this does go for the upper tier touchscreen Garmin units too, touchscreens need a bare finger or a touchscreen compatible liner glove or, well, a stylus. This is not helpful in a load of environments, especially cold ones. Also, smartphones aren't that rugged. Finally, large touchscreens and background processors burn through tons of battery power. You can't operate a smartphone in minus 30 degree air for more than a few minutes. So, a demand will persist from outdoorsy people for a tough, waterproof GPS unit with an efficient screen, push buttons and replaceable batteries. The problem is that only Garmin remains in that market. They even ate up the company that makes in-reach units. There's no competition, no need to innovate. One piece of evidence for you. Their current range of small handhelds uses a mini USB interface. Yes, mini USB in 2024. And their software, welcome to the 1990s. But that's not as crucial as what I've stumbled across recently and the reason for this episode. Now for a completely separate reason, in this pocket I have a venerable Garmin original E-Trex. This isn't even the E-Trex H, which was the high sensitivity version. And this one has the software from the year 2000. I've had it for God knows how long now. It's probably worth 10, 15 pounds. But there's a reason why I've been relying on that. And I'm now gonna shift back to a slightly warmer place. It's about minus 32, minus 33 degrees this morning. And I'm gonna go back to somewhere where I can go into more detail about why this one has really hacked me off and why you should be very careful if you're currently looking at this sort of range of Garmin E-Trex GPS units. As is something of a tradition now, halfway through one of my training runs, I'm running some errands and one of them is to come to my unit down here on the ground with Vanguard and I'm going to get the box for this Garmin unit because obviously it's going back, they're not keeping my money. The first problem has been with batteries. Most of these units take a pair of AA batteries. Importantly, they are supposed to accept a variety of types and chemistries. The three common ones offered here are single-use alkalines if your needs are modest, or if you're desperate, and or it's not cold where you are. Next, rechargeable nickel metal hydrides, like these high-performance, low-self-discharge Enerloop Pros. Finally, single-use primary lithium batteries, which offer high capacity, low weight, and an impressively flat discharge curve even in the deep cold. I'll explain what I think the issue is in a moment. Let's start by saying I've used all these three types successfully in Garmin's before and then we'll get these cheap alkalines in. This powers the GPS up and it will give me a chance to show you the menu system that allows you to select which battery type you're using. There's only one reason for this, so that the battery level indicator is accurate, as these battery types have some fundamental differences. If the unit powers up as it does here, so it follows that it's saying it's happy with the power source. The standard base map is also displaying properly. Next, let's click in the nickel metal hydride rechargeables at full charge. Here's where the issues start. Nothing. No beep sound either. 
Then I tried again and you could see a very, very faint Garmin logo on the screen along with a bleep, but no power on. I then tried half full Nettle Metal Hydrides and finally Life, but now no base map. And in the mapping selection menu, you try and choose a map only to get a weird blue screen with no options on. I had this behavior on two brand new 32Xs and a friend has reported the same with his. Now for the lithium double A's, my usual default choice, and my choice for years in each Rex, 10s, 20s, 30s, plus GPS map 60 series units. Nothing. No bleep, nothing on the screen. I tried a hard reset button combination, nothing. These batteries are fresh and in date. The only good news is that the second unit is now ready to head back for a refund to the unfortunate retailer, who it turned out was very keen to actually get a detailed report of the issue. It's clearly not an isolated incident, and it costs retailers time and money to process returns and refunds. There we go, got it. Here's what I think the problem is. Battery voltage, or rather the units not handling voltage properly. A reminder that these GPSs are specifically marketed to work with all three. These are the very specific models, however, Garmin have identified as having issues dealing with higher voltages. So Garmin are alive to the topic of voltage incompatibility. Alkaline AA's tend to be just above or below 1.6 volts when full. Nickel metal hydrides vary, but inner loops tend to be around the same hot off the charger, but often settle a little bit lower, perhaps 1.45 volts-ish. Lithium AA's, however, can read 1.8 or even 1.9 when brand new. They all tend to quote unquote die at around 1 volt. I know the range at the top end sounds quite wide, but good DC electrics are designed to be flexible within reason. For example, many good devices rated at a nominal 12 volts will happily work with a source between 11 and perhaps as much as 30 volts. A good internal controller can allow for a range, and Garmin claims theirs does. Using Occam's razor, my best guess is that the power circuits in a batch of 32x units are faulty or the wrong spec and are rejecting startup voltages. Whether the processor actively or wrongly says no thank you, not today, or doesn't even get that far, I don't know. I did by the way use the alkalines to boot up and go to the battery type menu and make sure that those matched before trying other batteries, but it seems implausible that this menu setting would affect startup. It's surely just needed for the battery level indicator. Then there's the weird mapping behavior, sometimes denying you the base map. Is that power related to? A sort of safety feature being tripped? And don't get me onto the comically clunky Garmin software and PC interface experience. A swathe of different apps and programs, none of them modern nor coherent or willing to interact. Some of them are now obsolete and the others really should be. I lost hours to the basic task of trying to register and update the first 32x I tested, let alone trying to install a custom map. Failed connections, timeouts, empty menus, inconsistent error messages, totally maddening. And the ancient old yellow e-trex? All batteries I tried, at all sensible states of charge, on it goes. The little man walks across the screen and you're in business. It tells you where you are and it lasts practically forever on a set of batteries. Dependable. This is what a GPS must be. Well, here are the two units once more. And what I've not been trying to do over the last few minutes is to scare anyone unduly, but just to warn you to check the units that you've got, because these really matter if you're in a cold place, if you're somewhere remote where you need to know exactly where you are for navigation for safety purposes. So just check under different types of battery chemistry and check in different temperatures that your unit is performing reliably. If not, take it up with Garmin and get them to sort it out. Garmin, you ignored my message online about this, but your right of reply continues. Bye.